Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our session today, What's Happening in Healthcare and How to Prepare. Um, you can come closer if you'd like so we can see you. My name is Judy Rosenblum. I am the president of JR Associates. I'm here with my colleagues from MedAxiom, Joel and Jeff, and they'll introduce themselves as well when they go through their session. Um, I am also, I, I have a consulting company in reimbursement, and I am the coding consultant and reimbursement consultant for the American Society of Echocardiography. I was a cardiac sonographer, so we speak the same language, and I'm happy to be here and to be able to educate you on coding. Many of you have spoken to me in the past. So, just to get started, we cannot talk about coding without the other components. And so just to give you a brief overview, when we talk about reimbursement, it's actually made up of three very big buckets. One is coverage, one is coding, and one is payment. And we'll focus today on coding, but I have to bring your attention to the coverage component because coverage is all about what we call medical necessity, what you know as medical necessity, the appropriateness. Why is the patient there? What's the clinical circumstance? In order for an echocardiogram or vascular ultrasound to be done. And so that is actually the start of why something should be coded, because there needs to be medical necessity. And that starts the story. The code part is really, coding is just really a language. It translates what was done and why it was done so it could be put on to a claim form and, and, and be able to submit a claim and get a payment in return, supposedly. And things are changing, as you know. And the point that I want to just bring up to all of you as we talk about coding and reimbursement and all the different components is the fact that just because there's a code doesn't mean that there is a separate payment attached to that code or that you will get paid separately. And that's an important piece. It may mean that you're still getting reimbursed for that particular procedure. You just may not see a separate payment, especially since we're moving into episodic and bundling of payments. But reporting the code for the appropriate reason does allow you to be able to account for the fact that you actually did a service and it was done for a particular reason that maybe it brings you payment, and maybe it also allows you to be able to document the resources used in order to do that service. So when we talk about codes, there's lots of them, there's lots of different types of codes, and the whole point behind the codes, obviously, is that we're accessing reimbursement payment. That's typically what most people are interested in. But now codes are being used more and more to measure quality and effectiveness of patient care. It helps in decision making. Um, it helps to really narrow the focus of what was really done and why it was. And more importantly, more and more what we're seeing is that it's profiling, uh, what utilization, it's trending, it's validating, and it's used for contracting. So if there's a, a, the opportunity to contract, let's say for a particular, let's say for just heart failure, for all the services that go into heart failure, the codes are going to be used to help establish pricing. If any of you um, are involved in coding, actually let me ask, how many people are actually the ones who are putting the codes down to get to the billing department? Most of you, okay. So then you're familiar with the fact that there are two different code sex sets that are uh, predominantly used. One is CPT, which is the procedure code, and the other one is ICD-9. And ultimately, those two, when they're put together, should equal payment or could equal payment. But the CPT code actually is the procedure, and the ICD-9 is the clinical circumstance or defines the medical necessity. Now, how do you find that medical necessity? There's an abundance of published coverage policies for echo and vascular ultrasound by payers that, you can serve, that serve as resources for medical necessity. I usually suggest that you go to your Medicare website and download, there's usually uh, a plethora of, of uh, 
coverage policies for both echo and vascular ultrasound that list the ICD-9 codes. And you can use that as a jumping off point. There's so many codes listed that for the most part, it usually applies to most payers. Um, there's variations, but it's really a good uh, way to just start off and understand what payers will use as far as their med medical necessity. The codes really reflect the medical record, and documentation must tell the story. So there needs to be some very thorough documentation. Be specific. Record what was done, why, and the findings. There should be a separate written interpretation report, not a notation just in the chart. And then um, the study also, there needs to be the opportunity for study archival for subsequent review in order to demonstrate that a separate diagnostic or imaging procedure was performed. The big report elements to stand out is obviously the patient demographics, the relevant clinical information. Don't be, um, don't be afraid to provide information in terms of the relevant clinical information. The more information, the better, to give the clinical story. In terms of the procedure itself, identify all the procedures, 2D color, Doppler, 3D contrast, if it's a complete or a limited. Identify all of those pieces, document your measurements. Note if, if anatomy views are attempted but not adequately identified, because CPT defines the fact that they, a complete echo should have all four chambers and all four valves. And obviously give an impression, a specific conclusion if possible. Some coding tips that are pretty important for ICD-9, the medical necessity. Code any documented, confirmed, or definitive diagnosis from the report. What does that mean? If somebody comes in with shortness of breath and you actually identify, let's say, mitral stenosis, then the diagnosis is actually mitral stenosis, not the shortness of breath. If there isn't a definitive diagnosis on the echo or whatever procedure you're doing, then use the codes that describe the signs and symptoms. Why did that patient show up? Was it shortness of breath, chest pain, what, what, whatever it might be? So if you cannot have anything on the report that's specific, always code for the signs and symptoms that have been identified or sent in to you. There are some other codes that can be used for circumstances other than cardiac disease or injury, and those are V codes, and those are usually payable codes and helpful to be able to describe the situation, uh, such as preoperative exams or toxicity f with chemo. So here's an example of reporting signs and symptoms with an underlying existing condition, patient has insulin-dependent diabetes, complains of chest pain when exercising, the stress echo is done, the results are normal. What gets coded? Well, you code the ch chest pain as the primary diagnosis, and the diabetes is the secondary. What that does is it supports the reason why a stress echo was done. It identifies that there could have been a cardiac-related problem, and that's why that, there was medical necessity. Reporting a rule-out diagnosis, we still always have that problem. Uh, the orders for rule-out, you know, this is a simple one, rule-out mitral valve prolapse. The patient reports shortness of breath and chest pain. The results are normal. In this particular case, you would code for the patient's symptoms of those chest pain again. Reporting surgical follow-up. This is an example. Um, I answer the questions. There are frequently asked questions that come through uh, through the ASC um, advocacy website. And so this was a common one. When a patient comes back for transthoracic after an ASD or a PDA device placed, which is uh, they're using a once a year protocol for the first few years, what ICD-9 code can be used because the patient no longer has an ASD or a heart defect. And the, here is an example of a V code that can be used, which actually demonstrates that there was a personal history of corrected congenital malformations, et cetera. There's also been some questions recently about reporting screening due to family history of bicuspid aortic valve or HIOCM. 
um, there are multiple codes that would be uh, that would demonstrate that you would be that would be relevant for you to report this and I've given you some samples here and just be aware that even though you again you may have those codes and that availability uh, insurance companies may or may not pay for that because they may not see this as medical necessity or um, they may see this as screening so let's move on to see the common CPT coding inquiries, what elements are included in a complete echo, which is 93307 and 06. And as I said before, per CPT, the anatomy must be um, identified, all four valves, all four chambers. And just note if you cannot get those, uh, if you cannot visualize or document the, them in the report. You could still then uh, bill for a complete as long as you attempted, but you could not get it. What is a limited or follow-up transthoracic echo? It's defined by CPT as an exam that does not evaluate all the structures. It answers a single focused question. So for example, to evaluate any change in the size of a pericardial infusion. It's those particular circumstances that you can bill for a limited. Is there a limited transesophageal code? And the answer is no, there is not. But CPT does not define TEE as complete or limited, so the code should be reported regardless of the protocol that you use. When performing an echocardiogram for congenital heart defects, we use congenital code 93303 with the Doppler codes. If the study reveals a normal cardiac structure, does the code have to be changed back to 93306? And this is according to CPT. If you are um, scanning and there is, it's a normal echo and you're looking for congenital disease, according to CPT, you should not use the congenital codes. Now we can debate that, but that, those are the rules that CPT has put forth. Can a transthoracic echo routinely be billed with a stress echo? The answer is no. There are coding edits that have been put together with, trans, uh, with uh, transthoracic echo with resting and with stress because it, the stress echo code was established with resting echo. There are certain circumstances in which you can bypass that coding edit, and those circumstances are if, you have, if you're doing the stress echo for one reason, and if there's a clinical circumstance that you need to do a resting echo as well. I will caution you that if you do bypass that on a routine basis, that upon audits, the documentation really must support that there was medical necessity for those two tests to be done at the same time. What is the difference between stress echo codes 93351 and 93350? Simply put, because this is a very common question and gets very confusing, 93351 is reported by both the hospital and the physician when both the stress test, all the components of the stress test are done with the stress echo. The hospital always reports 93351 regardless of what department the stress test or the stress echo is being done in. 93350 is only reported when the different components of the stress test are split between different, between different physicians. So it's really a breakout of the stress test that makes the decision if the 93350 should be reported or the 93351. How is saline echo reported? It's actually reported at the same as, a, as any kind of echo. You report the base, the primary echo codes. There is no separate reimbursement for saline, and the actual um, supply of the saline is bundled into the procedure. There is a code, but it really, it will never be paid. Contrast. Should we report the contrast agent when used in the office or the hospital setting? Absolutely. There is not a separate payment made for the contrast agent when done in the hospital setting. However, it is very important 
to actually report those Q codes, the appropriate contrast agent code, assign a charge, and submit it. Medicare uses those charges to actually do future rate setting for the procedure of the contrast echo. And without the contrast agent being reported, they will not accommodate or they will not allocate the cost of the contrast agent. It is very important, and I emphasize, that the Q codes, whichever contrast agent you're using, should be reported. How is contrast stress echo reported by the physician? The physician gets to bill either the stress echo 93350 or 93351, and the physician also gets to bill 93352 to describe the administration. How is contrast stress echo reported by the, um, oh, this is, there's an error here, I'm sorry. How is contrast stress echo reported by the hospital is what it should say. This is for the procedure. Medicare has assigned specific C codes that describe a str all echo procedures with contrast, and there's a sample of a stress echo on the, um, in, the, in the box. What's really important is the fact that these are Medicare-only procedure codes, and they must be submitted with the Q code, and for all other payers, use the standard CPT codes 93350 or 93351, unless otherwise indicated by the payers. Is there reimbursement for 3D with Medicare? It depends. Unfortunately, it's a little complicated. For physicians, the 3D codes are eligible for separate payment. However, there are very few for Medicare, there are very few policies that are very specific as to what medical necessity is. And so therefore, whether you will get paid or not is, diffi is, is difficult. There is a couple of Medicare carriers that identified code 793.2 as a nonspecific code that can be reported as a secondary diagnosis. Therefore, you need a primary diagnosis to demonstrate why, contra I mean, why 3D was, uh, is necessary. Hospitals, uh, Medicare does not recognize uh, 3D for a separate payment. They have bundled that payment into the primary base codes of, of ECHO. So while you're not seeing a separate payment, they have allocated the cost of, the, um, of 3D into the primary base codes. In terms of private payers, that's become a difficult challenge because private payers are, are um, allowing for, uh, are asking for uh, pre prior authorization, and they are not d doing it for echocardiography. They want prior authorization under radiology guidelines. So I've been hearing more and more about difficulties of getting that reimbursed under private, under private payers, and we're going to have to address that issue. So I can summarize with that thorough documentation of the medical necessity will allow for accurate coding and obtaining payment. Focus on medical necessity. The documentation is really important to help support should you get audited in the future. If you have any kind of uh, opportunity to communicate with your business office or your coding department, please do try to create a workable solution to make sure that all the codes are accurate and that you are supported in your process of selecting the code. On the horizon, just to let you know that there is a possibility for a new CPT code for interventional transesophageal echo. It was accepted and it was submitted and accepted by CPT this year. And if approved, if um, there was some, it was approved, it has been valued by the RUC committee and uh, we will find out in November for the final rule as to what the valuation is and if CMS accepts that valuation. So stay tuned for, uh, to learn more about that code. Just to let you know, the ICD-10 codes that were scheduled to go into effect on, in October 2014 has been delayed to at least October 2015, so nothing to be concerned about at this time. And once again, I will let everybody know that there is an opportunity as a member, it's an exclusive membership benefit, that you can contact me directly um, and be able to ask any specific questions. And with that, thank you.